many years had passed in Egypt, and the generation of Joseph and all his brothers had died. Just as God promised, the Israelites multiplied greatly in the land of Egypt. Unfortunately, a new pharaoh was put in power who did not know of Joseph and all he had done to bring them such power and wealth. The king was very frightened of the large numbers of Israelites that lived in Egypt. He was afraid the Israelites would grow so large that they would want to leave the land and would no longer work to bring wealth to Egypt. So the Egyptians put slave masters over them and forced them into hard and bitter labor as slaves. They worked from dawn to dark in the worst conditions, and they no longer enjoyed the wealth and success that Joseph had brought them. The hard work didn't stop the Israelites from continuing to grow and multiply. The new Pharaoh ordered all the boys born to Israelites to be thrown into the Nile River and killed. A beautiful baby Hebrew boy was born, and his mother hid him for three months in their home. During this time, she came up with a plan to save him. She made a basket from bulrushes and covered it with sticky tar to keep the water out. She laid her baby boy inside the basket and put it in the water close to the shore. Her daughter, Miriam, hid a short distance away to see what would happen to him. Very soon, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to the river to bathe and just happened to see the basket floating among the rushes in the river. She asked one of her handmaidens to bring the basket to her, and when she opened the lid, the baby boy began crying. Pharaoh's daughter knew it had to be a Hebrew baby. When Miriam saw this, She quickly came up to Pharaoh's daughter and offered to find a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby boy until he was old enough to come back and live with her as her son. Miriam took the baby boy back to his Hebrew mother, who nursed him and took care of him until he was old enough to go to the palace and live with the Pharaoh's daughter as her adopted son. She named him Moses and raised him as her own. Many years passed and Moses became a young man. One day, he was walking and happened to see an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. This enraged Moses and he killed the Egyptian. When news of what Moses had done reached Pharaoh, he planned on killing Moses. And when Moses heard this, he quickly left Egypt and went to the land of Midian. It was at a well in Midian that Moses met his future wife, Zipporah, and went and lived with her family, tending her father's flocks in the desert. One day, Moses had taken the flocks into the desert, when from a distance he saw a bush that was burning on top of Mount Sinai. This mountain was called the Mountain of God. He went to see the burning bush, and an angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame. Moses could see that even though the bush was burning, it wasn't consumed by the fire. And as Moses got closer to inspect this unusual sight, God called out to him, Moses, Moses. Moses answered, Here I am. Then God said, Do not come closer. Take off your shoes, for the place you are standing on is holy ground. I am the God of your father, and the God of Abraham, 
Isaac, and Jacob. When Moses heard this, he hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then God told Moses, I have seen the misery and sufferings of your people by the brutal Egyptian taskmasters. I hear their cries of sorrow and pain. I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and bring them to a land that is flowing with milk and honey. Come now, Moses. I will send you to Pharaoh. You will bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Moses was very shocked and said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God answered Moses, I will surely be with you. This will be a sign that I sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. But Moses kept questioning God and finally asked, God, what if they did not believe me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake. And then the Lord said, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. When Moses lifted the snake by the tail, it immediately turned back into his staff. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord God has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, Put your hand inside your jacket. Moses did as the Lord said, and when he pulled it out, it was covered in leprosy, white as snow with the disease. Now put it back, said the Lord. Moses put his hand back inside his jacket, and when he pulled it out, it was restored and looked the same as his other hand. Then God said, If they don't believe either of these two signs, or listen to you, then take some water from the Nile, pour it on the ground, and it will become blood. Moses still continued to question God and said, O oh Lord, I have never been able to speak well, neither in the past or even after you have spoken to me. The Lord answered him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak, and will teach you what to say. Even then, Moses replied, Oh, Lord, please send someone else to do it. Finally, God became angry with Moses and said, Your brother Aaron can speak well and is on his way to meet you. I will help both of you speak and teach you what to do. It will be as if it is your mouth, and he will speak to the people for you. Afterwards, God instructed Moses to go back to Egypt and perform for Pharaoh all the wonders that God had given Moses the power to do. Then God spoke to Aaron and said, Go to the desert and meet your brother Moses on Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. When Moses saw Aaron, he told him all that God had instructed him to do and the miraculous signs that he had commanded him to perform. Aaron quickly agreed to go with Moses, and they returned to Egypt. They soon gathered all the elders of the Israelites together. Aaron told them everything the Lord said to Moses and also performed the signs. They all believed and were so thankful that God could see their pain and misery. They bowed down to the ground to worship and honor God for sending help to the Israelites. The Israelites grew and multiplied greatly while they were living in the land of Egypt. 
Joseph and his brothers and their generation had passed and a new pharaoh was crowned king. This pharaoh did not know of the wealth and prosperity that Joseph had brought to Egypt. When the Egyptian king saw how the Israelites were growing and multiplying, he became fearful that they would soon overpower the Egyptians and leave Egypt, causing them to lose all their wealth and power. He put slave masters over the Israelite people, and they were forced into bitter and harsh labor. God saw the pain and suffering of all the descendants of Israel and called upon a Hebrew man, Moses, to lead his people out of the suffering and pain. God had a beautiful land flowing with milk and honey that he wanted them to have. Now Moses was not confident in his own abilities to become a leader of God's people, even though God reassured him many times that he would be with him and give him the words to say. Finally, God allowed Moses' brother Aaron to help him. Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord God of Israel says. Let my people go into the desert to worship and honor me. Pharaoh answered, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. But they replied, Our God has met with us and instructed us to take our people, the Israelites, into the desert for three days to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. If we do not go, he may strike us with plagues or the sword. This angered Pharaoh, and he demanded that the taskmasters put even more work on the Israelites. This caused more suffering and hardship on the people, and they became very angry with Moses and Aaron. They said to them, How could you do this to us? You will be judged by God for bringing more suffering on us. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you brought trouble upon your people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought more work and hardship on them, and you have not rescued your people at all. But God sternly replied, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go and drive them out of his country. Now tell this to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will free you from being slaves to the Egyptians. I will redeem you and take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who rescued you and brought you to the land that I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for your possession. But the Israelites did not listen to Moses and Aaron, and they continued to be discouraged by the cruel bondage of the Egyptians. The time came for Moses and Aaron to go to Pharaoh again. They performed signs and wonders before him, but Pharaoh's Egyptian magicians did the same thing, so Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not listen to them. Then God began sending plagues upon the people of Egypt. The first plague God sent was the plague of blood. God commanded Moses and Aaron to call Pharaoh and all his officials out to the water's edge and say, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, Let my people go, so that they may worship me in the desert. But you have refused to listen. Then God commanded Aaron to raise the staff and strike the water of the Nile. As soon as the staff struck the water, it immediately turned to blood. Every stream, pond, and body of water in Egypt turned to blood and killed every living thing in them. The smell was so terrible that the Egyptians could not drink the water or go near it. When Pharaoh saw this, he turned his back and went into the palace and hardened his heart. Seven days passed, and the Lord said to Moses, 
Go to Pharaoh and say, This is what the Lord says. Let my people go, so that they may worship me. If you refuse, I will plague the whole country of Egypt with frogs. They will fill your rivers and come into your palace and into your bed. They will go into the houses of all your people. They will come upon you and your people and all over their possessions. Pharaoh refused to listen to them, so Aaron stretched out the staff over all the waters of Egypt, and frogs poured into the palace and homes of Pharaoh and all his people. Soon Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Pray to the Lord to take the frogs away, and I will release you and your people to go to the desert to pray and worship your God. So Moses left and prayed to God to take the frogs away. The frogs died and were piled into huge heaps. The land reeked from the smell, but when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and refused to let them go. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron to stretch out the staff and strike the dust of the ground, and all the land of Egypt will turn to gnats. When Aaron did this, the dust turned to gnats, and they covered Pharaoh and all his people and their animals. Even Pharaoh's magicians said, This is the finger of God! But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen. This time, God commanded Moses to tell Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says. Let my people go, so that they may worship me. If you do not release my people, I will send swarms of flies on you and all your people. Their houses and even the ground they walk on will be covered with flies. But upon my people, the Israelites, I will deal differently. No swarms of flies will go near them, and by this miraculous sign, you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. Then God sent swarms of flies into Pharaoh's palace and all the houses of his people. The flies ruined all the land throughout Egypt. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, I will let you go to offer sacrifices to the Lord your God in the desert. But don't go very far. Moses answered, I will pray to God for the flies to leave tomorrow. Only this time, do not deceive me. So Moses prayed, and the next day, all the flies left Egypt. Once again, Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let the people go. This time, the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and tell him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go, so that they may worship me. If you refuse, I will bring a terrible plague on all your livestock. Every horse, camel, donkey, sheep, goat, and all your cattle will die. But not one single animal belonging to the Israelites will die. The next day, when Pharaoh went out into the fields to investigate, all the livestock belonging to the Egyptians had died. But not a single animal that belonged to the Israelites perished that day. Once again, Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not let the people go. God's chosen people, the Israelites, were being held in brutal bondage and forced slavery under the Egyptian king, Pharaoh. God saw their pain and suffering and sent Moses and his brother Aaron to lead his people out of Egypt to a wonderful and good land. Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh and told him, God says, let my people go. But Pharaoh's heart was hard 
and he would not allow them to go. God knew Pharaoh's heart was stubborn and hard, so he began to send plagues on the people of Egypt. This was the only way the king of Egypt and his people would acknowledge that God was the one true and mighty God. The first five plagues were the plague of blood, the plague of frogs, the plague of gnats, the plague of flies, and the plague on livestock. Each time, Moses warned Pharaoh of the plague that he would bring upon the land of Egypt. And each time, even though there was much damage and destruction to Pharaoh and the people of Egypt, the king would harden his heart and refuse to let the Israelites go. But God was not finished with the king of Egypt and his people. Moses continued to listen to God and obey his commands. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from a furnace, and in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials, toss it into the air. It will be as fine dust, and it will settle on men, and festering boils will break out all over their bodies. The next day, Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded, and terrible festering boils broke out all over the bodies of the men. Still Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let the Israelites go. Then the Lord told Moses, Get up early in the morning and go to Pharaoh and say, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go, so that they may worship me, or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you and all your people, so that you will know there is no one like me in all the earth. By now, I could have struck you with a plague that would have wiped you and your people off the earth. For this reason, I have let you live, in order to show you my power and to proclaim my name over all the earth. But you still have hardened your heart and refused to let my people go. Therefore, tomorrow, I will send the worst hailstorm that Egypt has ever seen. The next day, God commanded Moses to stretch out his staff toward the sky. The Lord sent thunder and hail, and lightning flashed down to the ground. Throughout Egypt, hail struck everything growing in the fields and stripped every tree standing. The only thing that wasn't ruined was the wheat and spelt because they had not ripened yet. But the land of Goshen, where the Israelites lived, was not touched. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, This time I have sinned. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are the wicked ones. Please call upon the Lord to stop the thunder and hail, and I will let you go. So Moses left and went before God. Immediately the thunder stopped, and the rain and hail quit pouring down on Egypt. When Pharaoh saw this, he once again sinned, and refused to let the Israelites go. This time the Lord said to Moses, I have hardened the hearts of Pharaoh and his officials so that I may perform these miraculous signs. And you can tell your children and grandchildren how I brought all these devastating plagues upon the Egyptians. And you will know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord the God of the Hebrews says, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? If you refuse to let my people go, I will send locusts into your country tomorrow. They will be so thick, you will not even be able to see the ground. They will devour what little you have left in the fields. They will fill your houses, covering everything you own. When Moses left Pharaoh, all of Pharaoh's officials said to him, how long will you let this man do this to us? We beg you to let his people go. Don't you realize that Egypt is ruined? In response, Pharaoh went to Moses and said, Go, take your people and worship the Lord your God. But when Moses told Pharaoh that all the Israelites would be leaving, he became very angry. He cried, You are planning evil against me. You may go, but you can only take your men. So Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh. God then told Moses to stretch out his staff over the land, 
And the Lord caused an east wind to blow over the land of Egypt from morning to night. With the wind came the locusts. They came in such great numbers that the ground turned black. They ate everything in the fields that was left from the hail. Nothing green remained on the ground or the trees in all of Egypt. Then Pharaoh very quickly summoned Moses and Aaron and pleaded, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now forgive my sin once more. Pray to the Lord your God to take this deadly plague away from me. As soon as Moses prayed to God, he changed the direction of the wind to a very strong west wind, which picked up the locusts and carried them off to the Red Sea. Not one locust could be found anywhere in Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he refused to let the Israelites go. Then the Lord told Moses, Stretch out your hand to the sky, so that darkness will cover the land of Egypt for three days. It was so dark that no one could see anyone else, and they did not leave their homes. But all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. Pharaoh summoned Moses and cried, Go, worship the Lord. Even your women and children may go, but leave your flocks and herds behind. But Moses demanded, You must allow our livestock to go with us. Not a hoof must be left behind for we will need some of them to worship the Lord our God. Now Pharaoh became very angry and shouted at Moses, Get out of my sight! Do not ever appear before me again! The day you see my face, you will die. It will be just as you say, Moses replied. I will never appear before you again. Now the Lord came to Moses and said, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and Egypt. This time he will let you go and drive you out of Egypt completely. By now, Moses was greatly respected by the people of Egypt. So Moses instructed all the Israelites to go to their Egyptian neighbors and ask for silver and gold to take with them on their way out of Egypt. Finally, Moses spoke before Pharaoh. This is what the Lord says. At midnight, I will go throughout the land of Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die, from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, to the firstborn son of the slave girl that sits behind the millstone. Even the firstborn of the cattle will die. There will be a great cry in all the land of Egypt that has never been heard before and will never be heard again. But not one child or animal of the sons of Israel will be hurt. And by this, you will know how the Lord distinguishes between the people of Israel and the Egyptians. Then all your officials and servants will bow down before me and beg me to leave and take all my people with me. After that, Moses, hot with anger, left Pharaoh. Then God spoke to Moses and Aaron, Go before all the people of Israel and give them these instructions to prepare them to leave Egypt. Each family is to select a lamb without blemish from among their herds. At twilight, they are to kill the lamb, take the blood, and wipe it on the sides and tops of the door frames of all the houses of the Israelites. Every family is to roast and eat the meat with their clothes and shoes on. When midnight comes, I will go through the land of Egypt and strike down all the firstborn of both man and animals. I will execute judgment on them all, for I am the Lord. When I see the blood on your doorposts of your houses, I will pass over you, and no plague will destroy your firstborn when I strike the land of Egypt. At midnight on the appointed day, the Lord came and passed through Egypt. All the firstborn sons in Egypt were struck down. The wailing and cries were heard in every house throughout the night. Even the firstborn of their livestock died that night. But the Lord passed over the houses of the sons of Israel 
and spared their lives. Pharaoh urgently summoned Moses and Aaron during the night and pleaded, Get up and leave from among my people and go worship the Lord as you want. Take your herds and flocks and go. The Egyptian people were so anxious to see the Israelites leave, they gave them gold, silver, and clothing as they prepared to leave on their journey to worship God. At last, Moses, Aaron, and all the Israelite people were released by Pharaoh to leave the land of Egypt. From that day forward, every year in the same month, the Israelites observed the Feast of Passover, which was a time to remember when God passed over their houses and spared their firstborn children because of the blood on their doorposts. As the final devastating plague of the firstborn descended upon the Egyptians, at last, Pharaoh released the Israelites into the care of Moses. In all, over two million Israelite people, along with their flocks and herds, left Egypt, where they had been held in bondage for 430 years to the day. The Egyptian people were so anxious for the Israelites to leave that they gave them their own gold, silver, and many articles of clothing as they began their journey to leave Egypt. Now Moses and his brother Aaron had no idea what direction to lead the people. So God provided a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to guide them. Neither the pillar of cloud nor the pillar of fire ever left their sight. Days passed and Pharaoh looked about and saw the ruin and devastation of the land and said to his officials, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have no one left to help rebuild our land. So Pharaoh took over 600 of the best chariots of Egypt along with their officers and quickly pursued the Israelites who were boldly marching away from Egypt towards the Red Sea. As Pharaoh and his enormous army of chariots approached, the Israelites became terrified. They cried out to Moses, What have you done to us? You should have just left us alone. It would have been better to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses rebuked the people and said, Do not be afraid. Stand still and the Lord will fight for you. You will never see these Egyptians again. Then the angel of God, who was going before Israel, moved and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front of the Israelites and stood behind them so that it was between the army of Egypt and Israel. Moses stretched out his hand over the Red Sea and suddenly a strong and mighty wind from the east blew in and parted the waters of the Red Sea. The Israelites began to travel through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. All the Egyptians, with their chariots and horsemen, quickly followed them into the water that the Lord had parted for the Israelites. The Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud and began to cause great chaos and confusion to the Egyptian army. He made the wheels of their chariots come off so that they had difficulty driving. Then the Egyptians cried, Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Just as the Egyptian army turned to flee, the water came crashing down on them, and every chariot, horse, and man was swept into the sea and drowned. Not one Egyptian escaped the water that day. However, the Israelites went through the sea 
on dry land to safety. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hand of the Egyptians. When the Israelites saw the great power that God had displayed against their enemy, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in Him. The Israelites were God's specially chosen people. Moses and his brother Aaron were selected by God to lead them out of Egypt where they were being held in bondage and forced into slavery by the Egyptian Pharaoh. God brought ten devastating plagues upon Egypt before Pharaoh finally agreed to release them to travel to a land that God had chosen for them to live and flourish in. In a spectacular example of God's power and authority, the Israelites witnessed God parting the waters of the Red Sea in order for them to safely cross to the other side. Then to the Israelites' amazement, they turned and saw the waters crash down upon the Egyptian army as they pursued them into the Red Sea. Not one Egyptian was left alive. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. The Israelites saw the great power the Lord had displayed, so the people feared the Lord and put their trust in God and in Moses, his servant. As the Israelites began the difficult journey across the Sinai Desert toward the land of Canaan that God was going to give them, they began to grumble and complain. Every time they came up against a problem or need, all they would do is grumble and complain to Moses. Each time, Moses would go before God with their complaints, and each time, God would provide an answer to their needs. God never failed to meet every single need they had. Sadly, the Israelites continued to grumble and complain as they made their way across the desert. This was very difficult for Moses because even though they told Moses that they had faith and trusted in God, their actions didn't show it. In the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, they camped in front of a mountain in the desert of Sinai. It was from this mountain that God called to Moses. He instructed Moses to go before the people of Israel and tell them, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I carried you out of Egypt and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will obey my voice and keep my commandments, then you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples of the earth. You will be my holy nation. When Moses told the people what God had said, they quickly answered, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Prepare the people of Israel, because in three days I will come down to the top of Mount Sinai and appear to you and the people in a thick cloud. But be sure and warn the people to not go up the mountain or even touch their foot upon it, for if they do, they will die. On the third day, the people of Israel awoke to the sound of fierce thunder and lightning flashes coming down from the mountain. A cloud descended upon the top of Mount Sinai with the sound of a trumpet so loud that all the people of Israel trembled in fear within their camp. Moses brought all the people outside their camp to the foot of Mount Sinai to meet God with the warning from God to not touch the mountain or set foot on it. By this time, the entire mountain was violently shaking and engulfed in fire and smoke. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here. I will give you two stone tablets with the law and commands I have written for you and my chosen people, the Israelites. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai as Moses entered the cloud at the top of the mountain. Moses stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God. 
When the Lord finished speaking to Moses, God gave him two stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God that contained the Ten Commandments. Moses was to take and share them with God's chosen people of Israel. God spoke these words and said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. These are the Ten Commandments that you are to follow. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself any idol, nor bow down to it or worship it. The third commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The fourth commandment, you shall remember and keep the Sabbath day holy. The fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. The sixth commandment, you must not commit murder. The seventh commandment, you must not commit adultery. The eighth commandment, you must not steal. The ninth commandment, you must not give false testimony against your neighbor. The tenth commandment, you must not be envious of your neighbor's house or anything that belongs to them. Moses was sadly disappointed when he came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments. While God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on the mountain, the people of Israel grew tired of waiting. Even though they had agreed to follow all the commandments of God, their hearts fell back into sinful and rebellious behavior. They began drinking and behaving badly and even asked Aaron, the brother of Moses, to make them a golden calf that they could bow down and worship as a god. As soon as Moses saw the golden calf and the people of Israel worshiping the idol, he grew so angry that he threw the stone tablets to the ground, breaking them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. Afterwards, God struck the people of Israel with a plague as a consequence for their sin and rebellion. Soon, God once again called Moses to the top of the mountain and inscribed the Ten Commandments on two new stone tablets. As God passed in front of Moses, he proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. This time when Moses came down from the mountain after 40 days and 40 nights, the Israelites were ready to receive all that God had given him on top of Mount Sinai. Moses spent many days teaching the Israelites all that God wanted them to do in order to set them apart as God's chosen and treasured people. The people committed to obeying God's commands and worked very hard to fulfill all that God called them to do. Finally, God told Moses to prepare the 12 tribes of Israel to move on towards the promised land of Canaan. But once again, their old habits of complaining and grumbling began to be heard throughout the camps as they traveled in the desert. At first, it was only a few of them complaining, but very soon, many of the people began to grumble every day. Eventually, everywhere Moses went, he could hear every family wailing and complaining to anyone who would hear. Moses was very troubled and distressed. He went before God and asked, Lord, what have I done to bring all this trouble upon myself? Why should I carry the burden of all these people? They keep wailing and complaining and the burden is just too heavy for me. I cannot do it by myself. God is such a loving and compassionate God and he saw the distress and pressure that Moses felt. So he came in a cloud and brought the Spirit of God into 70 of the elders of Israel to help Moses carry the burden of the rebellious people of Israel. But the people still continued to talk against Moses and complain and grumble when things didn't go their way. One day, the people of Israel were traveling through the desert of Zin 
and camped at a place called Kadesh. No water could be found, so the people quarreled with Moses and Aaron and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? There's no water for us or our animals. There are no grapevines or fruit to eat. We would have been better off dead. Moses and Aaron, in great distress, went to the holy tent and fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, Take the staff, and you and Aaron gather the people together before the large rock that is among you. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will pour out water. Then the people will have plenty of water for themselves and their animals. So Moses took the staff and gathered the people in front of the rock and cried out, Listen, you rebellious people, we must bring you water out of this rock. Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with the staff. Water gushed out, and the people of Israel and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not follow my holy command to speak to the rock, and instead struck the rock with the holy staff, neither one of you will be allowed to bring my people of Israel into the promised land. These were the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and where he showed himself holy among them. Moses and Aaron were very sad and disappointed that they would not be allowed to enter the promised land, but they also understood how important it was that the people of Israel obey and honor the commands of God. Moses, Aaron, and the Israelites continued to journey through the desert for the next 40 years, settling and resettling in many different regions of the desert until the entire generation of rebellious Israelites that had left Egypt died. In the meantime, a new generation of Israelites had grown up who had obeyed and listened to the commands and laws of God spoken to them by Moses and Aaron. When the day of Moses' death was near, God spoke to Moses and told him to call Joshua, the son of Nun, before all the people of Israel. Joshua had always shown great love and obedience to the Lord. Moses spoke the words of the Lord to him. The Lord your God will go ahead of you across the Jordan River. He will destroy the nations before you, and you will take possession of their land. The Lord will deliver them into your hands. Be strong and courageous, and do not be afraid. The Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Moses gave one last command to the people of Israel. He said, The Lord your God commands you this day to carefully follow and obey all his decrees and laws. He will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and many blessings will come upon you if you obey the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees, many curses will come upon you. You will be defeated by your enemies and diseases will come upon you. I have set before you life or death, blessings or curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. Moses died, and the people of Israel accepted Joshua, the son of Nun, as their new leader, appointed by God. Joshua led them into the Promised Land and prepared the twelve tribes of Israel to go in and take the land. All the inhabitants of the land greatly feared the Israelite people because they had heard of the powerful hand of God and all that God had done for the people of Israel. Every town shut and locked their gates to keep the Israelites out. The town of Jericho was tightly locked up, and no one came in or went out. One day, Joshua was near Jericho. He looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with his sword drawn. 
Joshua went to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. I have come as captain of the army of the Lord. When Joshua heard this, he fell face down on the ground and asked him, What message do you have for the Lord's servant? The captain of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. The Lord said to Joshua, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. Gather together all your armed men and command them to march around the city of Jericho once a day for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark of the Lord, blowing the trumpets as they march. On the seventh day, they shall march around the city of Jericho seven times with the priests, blowing their trumpets as they march. When you hear them sound the long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the walls of Jericho will collapse, and your armed men can go in and take over the city. Joshua immediately called all the people to him and told them what the Lord commanded them to do. The first day, seven priests carrying trumpets walked in front of the ark of the Lord, blowing their horns. A group of armed men marched in front of the priests, and the rear guard marched behind them. During this time, Joshua commanded the people, Do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. On that day, when I say shout, shout as loud as you can. They marched around the city of Jericho once that day, and then they all returned to their camp for the night. Early the next morning, Joshua once again commanded the seven priests, with armed men in front and behind them, to blow their trumpets as they marched around Jericho one time, and then returned to their camp that night. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, the people of Israel got up at daybreak, and this time they marched around the city of Jericho seven times, with the priests carrying the ark of the Lord and blowing their trumpets loudly. Then Joshua commanded the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city of Jericho. When the trumpet sounded, the people gave a loud shout, The walls of Jericho collapsed. All the men of Israel armed with swords charged into Jericho and killed every living thing. They burned the entire city and everything in it, saving the gold, silver, and articles of bronze and iron to be put into the treasury of the Lord. The Lord went before Joshua and the army of the Israelites that day, and the mighty power of God was spread throughout the land striking fear into the hearts of their enemies. After the miraculous fall of Jericho, the Israelites continued to take the cities that God had promised them. When the time came for Joshua to die, he gathered the tribes of Israel and said, This is what the Lord God of Israel says, I brought you into the land of your enemies and delivered them into your hands. I gave you land you did not work and cities you did not build. Now, fear the Lord your God, serve Him with all your heart, and walk in His truth. You must throw away the foreign gods among you and yield your hearts to him, for he is a jealous God and will leave you if you continue to serve other gods. When the people of Israel heard this, they all quickly said, We will serve the Lord our God and obey him. But once again, as soon as Joshua died, 
a new generation grew up that did not know God and began to serve the gods of those that lived around them. They worshipped idols and brought evil into their lives. God became very angry with His chosen and beloved people, and His presence no longer went with them to defeat their enemies. They were crushed by their enemies every time and would cry out to God for help and deliverance. Each and every time, God would send them a deliverer to rescue them from their enemies. A nation of people called the Midianites began to oppress the Israelites. They took all their cattle and livestock and trampled all the crops they planted. The Israelites cried out to God in great distress. God heard their cries and sent an angel of the Lord to a man named Gideon. The angel said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But Gideon answered, Sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? The Lord looked at him and said, Go in the might and strength I have given you, and save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. But Gideon said, How can I save Israel, my Lord? My tribe is the weakest, and I am the youngest in my family. The Lord answered, I will surely be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites as one man. Even though Gideon loved and served God, he wanted a sign from God to prove that he was calling him to deliver the Israelites from the Midianites. So Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you promised, I will place a fleece of wool outside on the ground, and if it is wet with dew in the morning, and all around it the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. Early the next morning, Gideon checked the fleece and wrung out a bowl full of water while the rest of the ground was dry. Then Gideon said to God, Please do not be angry with me, but give me one more test with the fleece of wool. At this time, make the fleece dry and the ground around it wet in the morning. And that is exactly what God did for Gideon to prove that he would use him to rescue the Israelites by his own hand. Gideon soon gathered 32,000 warriors to go and attack the Midianites. But God spoke to Gideon and said, You have too many warriors, and I do not want the Israelites to think they brought victory by their own hand. God then commanded Gideon, Announce to the Israelites, Anyone who is fearful and afraid, you may leave and return to your families. That day, 22,000 warriors left, and 10,000 were made. God spoke again to Gideon. There are still too many men. Go down to the water and watch how the men drink. Separate the ones who lap like a dog from their hands, and those that kneel down and drink the water with their mouths. 300 men lapped water from their hands, and all the rest kneeled down to drink with their mouths. God then said to Gideon, I will save you with the 300 men that lapped water from their hands and give the Midianites into your hand. Send the rest of your warriors home to their families. The camp where the Midianites had gathered to attack Israel was in a valley below Gideon and his 300 warriors. During the night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up and go down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. But if you are afraid to attack, then take a servant down to their camp to hear what they are saying, and this will give you courage to attack them. Gideon and his servant snuck close to the camp of the Midianites just in time to hear one of their warriors telling his friend, I had a dream last night that a round loaf of bread came tumbling into our camp and struck a tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. This frightened his friend and he replied, it means nothing. Other than the sword of Gideon the Israelite, God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into the hand of Gideon. When Gideon heard what the two men were saying, he left and worshipped and thanked God for giving him the confidence to attack the Midianites. When Gideon returned to the camp of Israel, he said, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianites into your hands! Gideon separated the 300 men into three groups of 100. 
He placed empty jars with torches inside them into their hands. Then he instructed them, follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, you will do the same and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Then smash the jars on the ground while you hold your trumpet in your right hand and your torches in your left hand. All three groups surrounded the camp and waited for the sound of the trumpets. Suddenly, Gideon and his group of 100 blew their trumpets and smashed their jars on the ground. The other 200 did the same, creating a terrifying sound in the middle of the night. The Midianite soldiers jumped up, crying out as they ran into the darkness of the night. They were so frightened that they began fighting each other with their swords, killing each other within the camp. Gideon and his army of 300 quickly chased after the Midianite warriors. Many of the surrounding tribes of Israel soon came to help pursue the Midianites. That day, 120,000 Midianite warriors died by the swords of Gideon and his 300. During Gideon's lifetime, the land enjoyed peace from their enemies, and the Israelites turned their hearts back to God. Once again, the Israelites sinned against God while living among the Philistines. They began to serve the false gods and idols of the Philistines, thus repeating their sinful pattern of behavior. Because of this, God gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. During this time, they suffered greatly under the bondage of the Philistines. God saw their suffering and heard their cries. One day, an angel of the Lord appeared to a woman who had no children and said, You have never had a child, but you are going to become pregnant and have a son. When he is born, he must never cut his hair because he will be a Nazarite, set apart to God from birth, and he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. The woman soon gave birth to a boy. She named him Samson. His father and mother did just as the angel of the Lord instructed and never cut his hair to honor what God had commanded them. Samson grew and the Lord blessed him. He could feel the spirit of the Lord inside him. Unfortunately, Samson could be very stubborn and wouldn't always listen to his parents or seek the wisdom of God. This caused him to make many mistakes in his life that hurt him and his family. As he grew older, he saw a young Philistine woman in the town of Timnah. He thought she was very beautiful and told his parents to arrange for him to marry her. His parents begged him not to marry a Philistine woman since the Philistines worshipped other gods. But Samson insisted, so they planned a meeting with her parents. On their way to meet her parents, a young lion suddenly came roaring towards Samson. Instantly, the power of the Lord came upon him and he tore the lion apart with his bare hands. Samson knew his strength was from the Lord, but he continued in his stubborn and selfish ways. Samson's parents arranged the marriage with the Philistine woman, but Samson caused such trouble to her family that her father gave her to another man. When Samson found out, he lashed out in anger, causing much harm to the Philistines. To appease their anger, Samson's own people tied him up and handed him over to the Philistines. The Philistines came rushing toward him, shouting in anger and ready to attack Samson. Again, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Samson's ropes became like melted wax and dropped from his hands. Then, seeing the fresh jawbone of a donkey lying on the ground, he picked it up and, filled with the power of God, struck down a thousand Philistine men. After this, Samson was considered a leader among the Israelites. Sometime later, Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines never forgot what Samson did many years before, killing a thousand Philistine warriors with the jawbone of a donkey. They went to Delilah and said, See if you can lure him into telling you the secret of his great strength. 
Then we can overpower him and take him as our prisoner. They offered her 1,100 shekels of silver if she could find the secret to Samson's strength. The next day, Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength. How can I tie you up so that you can't get loose? Samson answered, If they bind me with seven fresh cords that have not been dried, then I will become weak like any other man. Delilah told this to the rulers of the Philistines, and they soon brought her seven fresh cords and hid in an inner room of her house. She bound Samson with the cords and then cried out, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the cords as easily as a string that had touched the fire, so his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, You have deceived me and told me lies. Now please tell me how to tie you up so that you cannot get loose. So he said, If they bind me with new ropes that have never been used, then I will become weak like any other man. Again, the rulers of the Philistines brought her new ropes and then hid in an inner room of her house. Delilah tied him up with the new ropes and said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And just like before, he snapped the new ropes from his arms like a thread. By this time, Delilah was very embarrassed and upset at how Samson kept tricking her about the secret to his great strength. She begged Samson, Each time you have lied to me and embarrassed me, now please tell me the secret of your mighty strength. This time he said, If you weave seven locks of my hair into a web and then pin it to my head, I will become weak and be like any other man. That night, while he slept, Delilah took seven locks of his hair and wove them into a web and fastened them on his head. Then she cried, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. Samson woke up and easily pulled out the pins in the web of hair that had been braided together. By now, Delilah was very upset with Samson and said, How can you say you love me when your heart is not with me? You constantly lie to me and deceive me, never telling me where your true strength comes from? She continued to bother him day after day until finally Samson became so annoyed that he told her the truth. He said, A razor has never touched my hair. I've been set apart as a Nazarite by God since my birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent for the Philistine rulers one more time. While they were hiding in an inner room of her house, she lulled Samson to sleep on her lap. While he was deep in sleep, a Philistine man quietly slipped in and shaved off all the braids on his head. Delilah cried, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But this time, when he got up to shake himself free, he soon realized that the mighty power of God was no longer with him, and his strength had left him. The Philistines then took Samson to the town of Gaza. They gouged out his eyes and put bronze chains on him and threw him in prison. Many sad and lonely months passed as Samson was put to hard work inside the prison. But during this time, his hair began to grow back. The Philistines were very happy that they had captured Samson and taken away his strength. One day, the Philistines gathered in the temple to worship their god Dagon, saying, Our god has delivered our enemy Samson into our hands, the one who has slain so many of our people. They were in such high spirits that they called for Samson to come to the temple so they could tease and humiliate him. They made him stand between two pillars of the temple. Samson said to the boy who was leading him, Place my hands on each of the pillars so that I can lean against them. The temple was full of men and women and all the rulers of the Philistines. About 3,000 people were watching and making fun of Samson as he stood between the two pillars. Samson called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, please remember me and strengthen me one more time so that I can get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson yelled, Let me die with the Philistines. Bracing himself between the two pillars, he pushed with all his might, and the temple came crashing down on all the men, women, and rulers of the Philistines. In the end, 
Samson killed more people when he died than when he lived. A famine swept through the land that God had given to the Israelites. A man named Elimelech and his wife Naomi, along with their two sons, decided to leave the town of Bethlehem in the country of Judah and go to the land of Moab in search of food. The family settled in Moab and eventually the two sons married women from the tribe of Moab. Sadly, Elimelech died and soon after, the two sons also died. Naomi was left all alone except for her daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. One day, Naomi heard the people of Moab saying the Lord had answered the prayers of the Israelites. The famine was over and once again, the Israelites began growing their own food in Bethlehem and the surrounding country where Naomi and her family had once lived. With a sad heart because of the loss of her husband and two sons, Naomi decided to return to Bethlehem and to the country where all her relatives lived in the land of Judah. Naomi and her two daughters-in-law packed up everything they owned and set off on the road back to Bethlehem. They had not gone far when Naomi turned to them and said, You have shown such love and kindness to me at the death of my husband and two sons. It will be best if you return to your mother's home, and may God bless you with husbands from the land of Moab. Then Naomi kissed each one, and they both began to cry and said, Please, let us go back with you to your people in the land of Judah. But Naomi said, Return to Moab and your relatives, my daughters. I will never have more sons for you to marry. It's better that you go back to your people and find a husband to marry. When Naomi said this, both Orpah and Ruth began to cry again at the thought of leaving Naomi all alone. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to Naomi and said, Please, do not ask me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and may God deal with me harshly if anything but death separates us. When Naomi realized how determined Ruth was to stay with her, they traveled on to the land of Bethlehem. Naomi and Ruth had no male protector or source of income since Naomi's husband and two sons had passed away. But God made provisions in His law to take care of both the poor and the widows. They were allowed to glean the leftover wheat or grain in the landowner's fields so they could take care of their families. Very soon, Ruth came to Naomi and said, Please, let me go out to the fields to pick up some leftover grain from the harvest. This will give us food to eat. So Ruth took a basket and went to the fields to glean the leftover harvest. Naomi had a relative of her deceased husband named Boaz. He was very wealthy and had many fields that were ready for harvest. Ruth happened to come to Boaz's field to glean. She had worked most of the day in the hot sun when Boaz saw her and asked his foreman in the fields who she was. When he found out that she was the daughter-in-law of his relative, Naomi, he approached her and said, Listen carefully, my daughter. Please stay in my fields among my servant girls and pick up all the grain you need. Whenever you are thirsty, you may get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. With great relief, she replied, why are you so kind to someone from a foreign land? Boaz kindly replied, I've been told about all you have done for Naomi after the death of her husband and two sons, how you left your homeland and family and followed Naomi to the land of Judah to love and serve the God of Israel. May the Lord richly reward you for what you have done. During mealtime that day, Boaz invited her to sit with him and share his food. Afterwards, he gave orders to his men to pull stalks of grain from among the bundles for her to easily pick up that day. Ruth returned home that evening, and Naomi saw that she had gathered a large amount of grain. She asked Ruth, Where did you work today? 
Blessed is the man who shared such a large amount of grain. When Ruth told her that it was Boaz, she replied, The Lord bless him. He is a close relative and one of our kinsmen redeemers. The kinsman redeemer was a male relative who had the responsibility to help a family member who was in trouble or need and usually involved redeeming their relative's property or freedom. For the rest of the harvest season, Ruth did as Boaz told her and stayed in his fields with his female servants and picked up the leftover grain for her and Naomi to live on. When the harvest was over, Naomi came to Ruth and said, My daughter-in-law, since you have found such favor with Boaz, wash and put on your best dress and go down to visit him while he is threshing his wheat on the floor of his barn. Wait until he is finished for the evening. And after he eats and drinks, he will lie down for the night. Lift the corner of his blanket and uncover his feet while he is sleeping. Then lie down at his feet and respect. During the night, Boaz woke up and was startled to find a woman lying at his feet. He asked, Who are you? Ruth replied, I am your servant, Ruth, and I am here to ask you to take me as your wife since you are a kinsman redeemer to Naomi. Boaz replied, May the Lord bless you. All the people of our town know that you are a woman of excellent character. You could have married many young men from among the city, but you've chosen me, a close relative and kinsman redeemer to Naomi. But there is a kinsman redeemer who is a closer relative to Naomi than myself. If he wants the responsibility of the kinsman redeemer and to take you as his wife, then I must let him. The next day, Boaz went to the town gate and sat down to wait for the kinsman redeemer. When Boaz saw him, he said, Come over here, friend, and sit down. After Boaz explained the situation to him, he decided not to accept the responsibility as kinsman redeemer to redeem Naomi's property and take Ruth as his wife. Boaz went back to Ruth with the good news, and they were soon married. Ruth eventually conceived and had a son that they named Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David, a future king. There was a certain man named Elkanah, an Ephraimite, that had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Penina had many children, but Hannah had none. This grieved and saddened Hannah's heart so terribly that each year when they all traveled to the house of the Lord to worship and give thanks to God, she would cry and refused to eat. Penina saw her grief and would make it even worse by taunting and teasing her because she had no children. One year, as they traveled to the house of the Lord to worship God, Hannah, once again, stood and wept before the Lord in deep grief and pain. Eli, the priest, was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the house of the Lord. Because of her great distress, she cried out to the Lord, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. As she kept praying to the Lord, Eli the priest watched her mouth. Hannah was praying fervently in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought that she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Hannah answered, O oh my Lord, I am not drunk from wine. I am a woman who is deeply troubled and am pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not think I am a worthless woman, for I have been praying to God out of my great anguish and grief. Then Eli blessed her and said, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel give you what you have asked of him. Hannah replied, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Afterwards, Hannah felt great hope within her and went on her way, no longer feeling sad or downcast. The next morning, the entire family traveled back to their home. 
the Lord remembered Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. Hannah's heart was full of joy for her son Samuel, but she never forgot her promise to God that if she had a son, she would give him back to the Lord to serve him all the days of his life. When the time came for the family to make their yearly journey to the house of the Lord to worship God, Hannah told her husband Elkanah, Samuel is still too young, but when I wean him, then I will make the journey and give him back to the Lord to serve God all his life, just as I promised. When Samuel was weaned from his mother, Hannah made the journey to the house of the Lord to give him to the service of God. When Hannah and Elkanah brought Samuel to Eli the priest, she said, O oh my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood before you desperately praying for a child. The Lord granted my request, so I have given him to the Lord to serve him all the days of his life. Elkanah and Hannah then traveled back to their home. Each year, as they would return to the house of the Lord to worship God for all his blessings, Hannah would visit Samuel and bring him a new robe to wear. Eli the priest would bless Elkanah and Hannah, saying, May the Lord give you children to take the place of the one that Hannah prayed for and gave back to the Lord. God was gracious and enabled Hannah to conceive. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. This filled Hannah's heart with joy and faith in the God of Israel. Meanwhile, Samuel continued to grow and serve in the house of the Lord and found favor with the Lord and with men. As Samuel grew up in the house of the Lord, the Lord was with him, preparing him to become a leader and judge of Israel one day. Eventually, Eli the priest passed away along with his two sons. His sons had been very evil and did not honor God and His commandments. Because of their evil actions, not one male descendant of Eli's family lived to reach old age. After the death of Eli and throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against all the enemies of the Israelites. The Israelites lived in peace through Samuel's strong leadership and devotion to the Lord. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his own sons as judges for Israel. But just as Eli's sons did not follow in the Lord's ways, neither did Samuel's sons. They were dishonest and could not be trusted. So all the elders of Israel met with Samuel and said, You are old, and your sons do not walk in the ways of God as you do. We want you to appoint a king to lead us, like all the other nations. This disturbed Samuel, so he went before the Lord in prayer. God said to Samuel, Listen to what the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected. They have rejected me as their king. They have forsaken me and served other gods from the day I brought them out of Egypt until today. Listen to them, but sternly warn them what the king will do to them. Samuel went back to the elders of Israel and told them what the Lord had said. He warned them what a king who reigned over them would do. A king will take your sons, and they will drive his chariots and become his horsemen. He will make them commanders over thousands and fifties. They will make weapons for war for him and equipment for his chariots. Some will plow his fields and reap his harvest. Your daughters will be put to work for him as well. They will bake and cook and do other household tasks. The king will take the best of your fields, vineyards, and olive groves. He will take a tenth of your grain and wine, as well as your cattle and donkeys and flocks. You yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. 
and the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people of Israel were a very stubborn and rebellious people and refused to listen to Samuel. They said, No, we want a king over us. Then we can be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard what the people said, he repeated it to the Lord. Then the Lord answered, Listen to them and give them a king. The Lord revealed to Samuel that he was going to send a man from the tribe of Benjamin for him to crown as king. The very next day, Samuel saw a man walking toward him, and the Lord said to him, That is the man that I spoke to you about. He will rule over my people. The man's name was Saul, and he had no idea of the Lord's plan. In fact, he and his servant were just out searching for some donkeys that had gone missing from his father's land. When Samuel told Saul the plans of the Lord, he could not believe his ears. He exclaimed, Sir, I am just a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel. My family is even the smallest family of the tribe of Benjamites. Why would you say such a thing to me? He could not believe that he would be chosen by the Lord to lead God's people and become king over them. Samuel continued to reassure Saul, and they went and dined together. Afterwards, they went to the rooftop of Samuel's house and talked a very long time. When daybreak came, Samuel called to Saul and told him to wake up and come down from the roof. Then Samuel got a flask of oil, poured it over his head, and said, The Lord has anointed you ruler over his people. When you leave me today, you will begin to prophesy and be changed into a different person. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he began to prophesy. Samuel summoned all the people of Israel to the Lord at a place called Mitzpah. Samuel then told them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you out of Egypt and out of all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, who saves you out of all your calamities and distresses. You insist on having a king. So now I will present one to you. Then Samuel brought forward the tribe of Benjamin in order to present Saul to the people of Israel. But when they looked for him, they could not find him. The Lord spoke and said, He has hidden himself by all the baggage. The people ran and found him and brought him out. As Saul stood among them, he was a head taller than everyone there. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. Afterwards, the people of Israel all began to shout, Long live the king! Long live the king! Therefore, the people confirmed Saul as king before the Lord, and all the Israelites held a great celebration to honor their new king. Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel for 42 years. During his reign, Saul ruled over Israel and fought against their enemies on every side. Saul would do as the Lord instructed, and God gave them victory over their enemies every time. But as time went on, Saul became confident in his own ability to rule and began doing as he pleased rather than obeying the words of the Lord. One day the Lord said to Samuel, I regret that I made Saul king. He has turned away from me and does not obey my instructions. The following day, Samuel went to Saul and said, You have not obeyed the Lord. Therefore, since you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king over Israel. Even though Saul begged and pleaded to remain king, Samuel told Saul, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, because you do not keep his commands. Now the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and will appoint him as king over the people of Israel. From that time on, Samuel never saw Saul again, though he mourned for him. One day, the Lord said to Samuel, 
How long are you going to mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? I'm sending you to Bethlehem to a man named Jesse. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Samuel took oil and traveled to Bethlehem to anoint the one whom God had chosen. As soon as he arrived, he found the man named Jesse. He asked him to bring all his sons before him. As soon as Samuel saw his first son, Eliab, he thought, surely the Lord's anointed is standing right here before us. But the Lord said to Samuel, He is not the one. Do not look on his appearance or his height, for the Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Seven of Jesse's sons passed before Samuel, but each time the Lord did not choose one to become king of the people of Israel. Finally, Samuel asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he's tending to the sheep. Samuel said, send for him, for we will not sit down until he arrives. When the boy arrived, Samuel saw that he had beautiful eyes and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the oil and anointed the young boy named David in the presence of his brothers. From that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came on David as the anointed future king of Israel, chosen by God. Saul and the Israelites continued to go to war to defend themselves against other enemy nations. One day, an enemy called the Philistines provoked the Israelites to war. The Philistines came to Judah and pitched their camp on a hill with the valley down below. The Philistines had a giant and fearsome warrior named Goliath. He was over nine feet tall and wore scale armor that weighed 125 pounds. He was so strong that his sword weighed 15 pounds. When the Israelites saw that the Philistines had set up camp on the hill in Judah, they assembled their own warriors on the hill opposite the Philistines. Every single day and night, Goliath would come down from the hill in front of the Israelites and take a stand. He would yell insults and taunt all the Israelite warriors. Goliath did this for 40 days and nights, and soon the Israelite warriors were filled with fear and dread of this giant Philistine. No one among the Israelites was brave enough to fight him. During this standoff, Jesse of Bethlehem asked his son, David, to take food and supplies to his three older brothers who were warriors for King Saul in the battle against the Philistines. As soon as David entered the camp of the Israelites, he saw his three older brothers standing in the battle lines facing the Philistines. David left his things with the baggage keeper and ran to his brothers. Just as he reached them, Goliath stepped out from his battle line and began to taunt and insult all the warriors of Israel. But when the Israelites saw Goliath, instead of charging into battle, they all fled in fear for their lives. When David saw this, he asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The men replied, The king will give great wealth to the man who kills this giant warrior. He will also give his daughter in marriage to him, and his family will not have to pay taxes in Israel. King Saul was told that David was talking to his warriors about the matter, so he sent for him. David said to King Saul, Let no man's heart have terror or fear on account of this giant. Your servant will go and fight him. But Saul replied, 
You are not able to fight against this Philistine. You are young, and he has fought many battles since he was your age. David said, I have tended my father's sheep as a young boy, and whenever a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and attacked it and rescued the lamb. If I can kill a lion and a bear, then I can do the same to this Philistine who has dared to taunt the armies of the living God. Then David said, The Lord, who has protected me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, will protect me from the hand of Goliath. Saul answered, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul placed armor and a bronze helmet on David for protection. David attached his sword over his armor and tested it to see if he could move well. But David was not used to the weight of the armor and took it off. Then he took his staff in his hand and went to the stream and chose five smooth stones and put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. With his sling and five smooth stones, he approached the Philistine giant. Goliath walked toward David, and when he saw him, he sneered at him, saying, You're nothing more than a kid. Who do you think I am? A dog that you come at me with sticks? <laughs> come here, he said. I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field to feast on. With great courage, David said, You come at me with a sword, a spear, and a shield. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the bodies of the Philistine army to be eaten by the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field, and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. Then all will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. This enraged the Philistine giant, and he came towards David to kill him with his sword. As David ran toward Goliath, he reached into his bag and put one smooth stone into his sling and slung it, striking Goliath on his forehead. The stone sank deep into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. David ran and stood over Goliath. He took his sword and plunged it into his body. And after he killed Goliath, he cut off his head. When the Philistine army saw this, they turned and ran in fear for their lives from the army of Israel. As soon as David returned from killing Goliath, he was brought before King Saul. That day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his home. As David, Saul, and the army of Israel returned from the battle with the Philistines, women came out from all the towns of Israel, joyfully singing and dancing, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. This angered Saul, and from then on, a bitter root of jealousy entered his heart. Because of David's great success and whatever Saul sent him to do, Saul promoted him to a high rank in the army. But for Saul, his bitter heart of jealousy would only continue to grow. This would be the beginning of many difficult and fearful times in the life of the courageous warrior and future king, David. During the early days of service to King Saul, David and Jonathan, King Saul's son, became the closest of friends. Jonathan loved David as a brother and cared deeply for his future. Unfortunately, the more success David had on the battlefield, the more jealous Saul became. One day, out of sheer hatred, Saul hurled his spear at David, trying to pin him to the wall. Even though David was able to escape, he lived in fear of an attack by King Saul. Saul even devised a plan for Jonathan and his servants to kill David. But when Jonathan reminded his father of all the great things that David had accomplished for the kingdom, he decided not to kill David. When David heard of this plan, his heart was in anguish, and he came before the Lord and cried out in prayer, Deliver me from my enemies, O God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from evildoers, and save me from bloodthirsty men. O oh, my strength, I watch for you and sing praise to you. O oh God, you are my fortress. 
my loving God. The next day, Jonathan came to David and they came up with a plan to find out if King Saul had still planned on killing David. Jonathan told David, go out to the field near us and hide beside the rock known as Azel. Then tonight, when we sit down to eat dinner and my father sees that your place is empty, he will ask me where you are. And I will tell him you are traveling to visit your family. If he answers well, then I know you will be safe. If he answers in anger, then I will let you know so that you can escape. If the king does not intend to kill you, I will come out to the field and shoot three arrows to the side of the rock where you are hiding. I will say to the boy who will fetch the arrows for me, Look, the arrows are to the side of the rock. Bring them to me. If you hear these words, you will know that you are safe from my father's anger. But if my father intends to harm you, I will shoot the arrows far beyond you. And by this you will know that you must leave in order to save your life from my father's wicked plans to kill you. That evening during dinner, King Saul noticed that David was not at his place at the table. When Jonathan told him that David was visiting his family in Bethlehem, Saul became so angry that he hurled his spear at his own son to kill him. Even though the spear missed Jonathan, he knew that his father intended to kill David. The next morning, Jonathan went out to the field with a young boy who would fetch his arrows. Jonathan's heart grieved at having to send David away, but his love for David was so great that he knew he must protect him from his father. Jonathan shot an arrow far beyond the rock where David was hiding, and then sent the young boy to get it. As soon as the boy returned with the arrow, he sent him away, and David came out from behind the rock. As David approached Jonathan, he fell to his knees and bowed before him. Then they embraced as brothers and wept together. They both knew that David would have to escape to save his life. David fled for his life into the wilderness of the hill country and hid among the caves. King Saul continued to search for him, but did not find him. During this time, many men heard where David was hiding and decided to join forces with him. One day, Saul got word that David and his men were hiding in the strongholds of En Gedi. Saul took 3,000 chosen men from Israel to search for David and his men. During the search, Saul went into the opening of a cave to relieve himself, and David and his men were hiding deep in the cave. When David's men saw King Saul by himself, they said, This is what the Lord meant when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands to deal with as you wish. Now David's heart was noble, and he would never kill an anointed king. So he quietly crept up behind King Saul and cut off a small piece of his robe. But soon afterward, his heart was bothered by what he had done. Saul left the cave to go on his way. David came out of the cave shortly after Saul left and called to him, My Lord, my King! When Saul looked behind him, David bowed before him and said, Today, your eyes have seen that God has given you into my hands, but I had mercy on you and refused to kill you. Look at this piece of your robe that I cut off. You can see that I have no evil plans for your life, even though you continually try to kill me. God, therefore, will be our judge, and he will decide between us. May he see my cause and deliver me from your hand. When Saul saw that it was David, he began to weep and said, The Lord delivered me into your hand today, and yet you did not kill me when you had the chance. May the Lord therefore reward you with good. I know that someday you will be king over all Israel. So please swear to me that you will not cut off my descendants. David made this promise to King Saul and then returned to the strongholds in En Gedi while Saul returned home. A period of time passed, but Saul still had a bitter and jealous heart towards David. Saul heard that David and his men were camped in the wilderness of Ziph, so he took 3,000 of his best men and went to search for David to kill him. When David heard that Saul and his army were camped close to where he and his men were hiding, David and a few of his best warriors snuck into Saul's camp at night. Saul was sleeping on the ground with his spear stuck in the ground beside his head, along with his water jug. The king was safely surrounded by his strongest soldiers. But God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Saul and all his men. And David was able to take Saul's spear and water jug without waking anyone. As they left the camp, David and his men stood on a hill a short distance from the camp. And David yelled down to Saul's men, What kind of men are you? 
that you did not guard your king and lord when we came into your camp to destroy him. As you can see, we have the king's spear and water jug that laid beside his head. Saul recognized David's voice and asked, Is that your voice, David? David replied, Yes, it is, my lord the king. Why are you pursuing me again? What have I done against you to deserve this? Then Saul replied, I have sinned today and done a foolish thing. Once more, you had the chance to take my life and did not do it. When David heard this, he said, The Lord will reward each man for his righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord delivered you into my hands today, and I refused to touch his anointed. Therefore, I pray my own life will be highly valued in the sight of the Lord, and he will deliver me from all my troubles. Saul answered, David, my son, may you be blessed and accomplish great and mighty things. Then they parted, and each went their own way. This was the last time that David would ever hide and fear death from the hand of King Saul. Shortly after, King Saul and three of his sons, including Jonathan, were killed near Mount Gilboa during a fierce battle between the Philistines and the Israelites. Many years would pass and many battles would occur before David was ready to become king. That day came when King Saul and three of his sons, including Jonathan, were killed in a battle between the Israelites and the Philistines. When David learned about the deaths of King Saul and his sons, his heart was filled with great sorrow. David would never forget Jonathan, whom he loved as a brother. David knew the time had come for him to take the position of king. The Lord instructed him to go to Judah in the town of Hebron. David, his family, and all the men who followed him traveled to Hebron, and there he was crowned king of Judah. At that time, the tribes of Israel split into two groups. One group was called Israel, and the other group was called Judah. After Saul's death, Abner, the commander of King Saul's army, brought in Saul's son, Ishbosheth and made him king over Israel. So Israel had Ishbosheth as their king, and Judah had David as their king. For seven and a half years, there was continual war between Israel and Judah. Judah and the house of David grew stronger and stronger, while Israel, led by their commander Abner, grew weaker and weaker. When Abner saw this, he went before the elders of Israel and said, for a long time you've wanted to make David your king. Now do it! For the Lord promised him, It will be by David that I will rescue my people Israel from the hand of all their enemies. So all the elders of Israel went to David in Hebron, where they anointed David as king over all of Israel. As king of Israel, David wanted to do one very important thing and that was to bring the Ark of God, which contained the two stone tablets of God's covenants, back to Jerusalem. David gathered 30,000 chosen men of Israel and brought the Ark of God back to Jerusalem and placed it in a sacred tent. David was a man after God's own heart, and he ruled with strength and courage. In the years ahead, David would bring many victories and great peace to the land of the Israelites by following the commands of God but he also made a serious and painful mistake that would result in harsh and bitter consequences for him and his future descendants. It all began one evening as he was walking on the roof of his palace that overlooked the city of Jerusalem. He saw a married woman named Bathsheba bathing in her house below. She was so beautiful that he sent messengers to her home and asked her to come to the palace. She stayed the night with King David, and the next morning he sent her home. Later, Bathsheba sent word to David that she was pregnant. David knew that he had committed a terrible sin in the sight of God, but what he did next only made it worse. When he found out that Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, was fighting in battle for him, he sent for him to come to the palace. When Uriah arrived, he refused to go to his own home and slept in the entrance of the palace with all the rest of the servants. 
When David saw that Uriah would not go home, he sent word to his commander, Joab, to place Uriah on the front lines of the battle, where the fighting was most fierce. Just as King David had planned, the next day, Uriah was placed on the front lines and soon killed in battle while defending Israel. Bathsheba mourned for her husband, and after her period of mourning was over, David sent for Bathsheba, and they were soon married. David's sinful behavior greatly displeased the Lord. Therefore, he sent a prophet named Nathan to King David. Nathan told David, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and one poor. The rich man had many sheep and cattle, but the poor man only had one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it and grew it up with his children. He loved the little lamb so much that it shared his food, drank from his cup, and slept in his arms. A visitor came to the rich man's house, and instead of taking one of his own animals to feed the visitor that night, he took the ewe lamb from the poor man to feed to his visitor. When David heard this story, he became enraged and said, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over for doing such a thing to another man. Then Nathan the prophet said to David, You are that man. The Lord God of Israel says, Was it not enough that I anointed you to be king over all Israel? I gave you everything you could have ever wanted, and I would have given you even more. Why have you hated the word of the Lord by doing such evil in his eyes? Now, because of what you have done, there will always be trouble and conflict in your family. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned greatly against my Lord. And Nathan replied, You are not going to die because the Lord has forgiven your sin. But because of your sin, your son born to you by Bathsheba will not live. David's son was born. Seven days later, the child died. David and Bathsheba were heartbroken. About a year later, Bathsheba became pregnant again and gave birth to another son. They named him Solomon, and the Lord loved him very much. David reigned for 40 years, doing what was just and right for all people. He loved God and walked faithfully before the Lord with all of his heart and soul. King David wanted to build a house for God, but God spoke to him and said, You are not to build a house for my name, because you are a warrior, and I have shed much blood. Your son Solomon is the one who will build my house. I have chosen Solomon to be king over Israel when your time comes to an end. I will establish his kingdom forever as long as he follows my commandments, as you have done. King David then appointed Solomon as king over Israel. Soon after, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. God told Solomon, Ask me for anything you want. Then Solomon answered, You have shown such love and kindness to my father, King David, as he walked before you in truth and righteousness and served you with all his heart. You placed me on the throne as king, yet I am still a young man and do not know how to lead this great nation of Israel. Please give me knowledge to know right and wrong and an understanding heart so that I can lead your people as their king. God answered, Since you have asked for this instead of riches and a long life, I will give you such great wisdom and understanding that there will be no one like you before or after you. I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and honor such that no one has ever seen. If you walk in my ways and obey my laws and commands like your father, King David, then I will give you a long life. Several days later, two women came before King Solomon with a problem. They both lived in the same house and each of them had a baby just days apart from each other. One of the women said, this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him, 
She got up in the middle of the night and took her dead son and put him next to me and took my son back to her bed. When I woke the next morning, I saw that the baby was dead as I looked closer. I knew the baby was not my son. The other woman immediately said, That's not true. The living one is my son, and the dead one is yours. They stood and argued before the king. Then King Solomon said, Bring me a sword. When they returned with the sword, the king gave an order, Cut the living child in two, and give half to one mother and the half to the other. As soon as the order was out of his mouth, the mother whose son was living yelled, Oh, my Lord, give her the living baby, please. Don't kill him. But the other woman said, Neither you nor I will have him. Cut him in two. Then King Solomon ruled, Give the living baby to the first woman. She is obviously the mother. All the people of Israel were amazed at the wisdom of King Solomon in deciding this matter. They realized that God had given Solomon great wisdom. Solomon's wisdom was greater than any other man, and his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel were prosperous and lived in safety. Because of this, King Solomon had an astounding amount of wealth, land, animals, vineyards, and anything he would ever need or want. King Solomon had such great wealth and riches that he began to plan for building the house of God. The house would store the Ark of God, which contained all the commandments that God had given to Moses on Mount Sinai many years before. The word of the Lord came to Solomon. As for this house you are building, if you will keep all my commands and obey them, I will do what I have promised. I will live among the Israelites and not abandon my people, Israel. 480 years after God commanded Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, in the fourth year of King Solomon's reign, he began to build the house of the Lord. It took the builders seven years to complete it. It was magnificent in every way. Inside the house an inner room was built that contained the Ark of God and was called the Holy of Holies. Many of the walls, floors, furnishings, and ceremonial objects were covered in gold or made of bronze. Solomon also built cities for his many chariots and horsemen. He built everything he desired in Jerusalem and throughout his entire kingdom. King Solomon grew richer and wiser than any other king on earth. People from every nation came to hear the wisdom God had given him. But the story of Solomon does not end like it began. Solomon married many women from the surrounding nations who worshipped idols and gods created by man. In his old age, Solomon began to turn his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to worship the Lord, his God. As Solomon's reign came to an end, the anger of the Lord came upon him because of his disobedience. God decreed that after his death, Solomon's son Rehoboam would become king. God would then tear all the tribes of Israel away from Rehoboam, except one. From that day forward, Israel was split once again and led away from following God. After the death of King Solomon, son of King David, the people of Israel split into two kingdoms. Of the twelve tribes of Israel, only two tribes chose to follow after God. Those two tribes were called the Southern Kingdom. The other ten tribes, called the Northern Kingdom, turned their backs on God and chose to follow after every evil thing, including the worship of false gods. This brought heartache and division to the people of Israel. The word of the Lord came to a man of God named Elijah. Elijah was instructed to tell Ahab, the evil northern king, this message. As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there will be neither dew nor rain unless I say. This upset King Ahab, so Elijah left very quickly. The Lord told Elijah to hide himself beside a brook in the wilderness. Each morning and evening, God sent ravens to bring meat and bread to Elijah, and he drank from the brook. Eventually, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land, just as Elijah had said. So God directed Elijah to go to the city of Zarephath, where a widow woman would provide for him. Just as he arrived at the gate of the city, 
a widow was there gathering sticks. Elijah said to the widow, Please bring me a drink of water and a piece of bread to eat. The widow replied, Sir, I only have a handful of flour left and a little oil. I'm gathering these sticks to prepare the last bit of bread for my son and I, and then we shall surely die. But Elijah answered, Do not fear. Go and do as I have said. Bring me a little bread cake first, and then afterward you can make one for yourself and your son. For our Lord says, The bowl of flour and the jar of oil will not go empty until I send rain upon the earth again. The widow woman did as Elijah said, and from that time on, the woman, her son, and Elijah were able to eat for many days. The bowl of flour was never empty, and the oil never ran out. One day, the widow's son got very sick and died. She cried out to Elijah, Since you have come here, my son has died! Elijah picked the boy up and carried him to the upper room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. He called out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, why have you allowed her son to die? Then he stretched himself over the child three times and called to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I pray you, let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard the cries of Elijah, and the life of the child returned, and he revived. When Elijah brought the boy down to his mother and she saw that he was alive, she said, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to King Ahab in the northern kingdom of Israel, and I will send rain upon the earth. Now this was no easy task for Elijah because he had spoken the word of God to King Ahab, warning him that no rain would fall unless he called it down. Since that time, a severe famine had spread across the northern kingdom, and great suffering had occurred. When Ahab saw Elijah, he said, Is this you, the one who brought all this trouble upon Israel? Elijah answered, It was not I who brought trouble upon Israel. It was you and your father's kingdom that have turned from the commandments of God and followed after Baals. Now, bring all of Israel to Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah that your wife Jezebel has brought into your kingdom. When the people of Israel arrived at Mount Carmel, along with the prophets of Baal and Asherah, Elijah looked at them and said, How long is it going to take you to choose between the Lord our God and Baal? But the people of Israel did not answer him a word. So Elijah said, Bring two oxen, one for the prophets of Baal and one for me. Have the prophets cut their oxen to pieces and place it on wood, but put no fire under it. I will do the same on my own altar and will not put a fire under it. Then let your prophets call on the name of Baal, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, He is God. The prophets took the pieces of their ox and laid it on the wood and began to call on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. They leaped and danced around the altar, but no one answered them. By noon, Elijah mocked them and said, Call out in a loud voice, since he is a god. He must be busy or on a journey, or maybe he's just asleep and needs to be awakened. So the prophets cried out even louder, leaping and yelling until evening, but there was no voice. No one answered, and no one paid attention to them. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near me. As the people of Israel surrounded Elijah, he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He took twelve stones, one for each of the twelve tribes of Israel, and built an altar in the name of the Lord. He dug a deep trench around the altar and then arranged the wood and pieces of ox on top. Finally, Elijah called for four jars of water to be poured over the sacrifice and wood on the altar. He told them to do it two more times and the water flowed around the altar and filled the trench. Elijah stood before the people of Israel and said, O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, today, let it be known that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. 
Then a powerful fire of the Lord fell and consumed the pieces of ox, the wood, the stones, the dust, and even licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people of Israel saw this, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God! The Lord, He is God! The people of Israel saw with their own eyes the power of the living God. Immediately after, Elijah commanded the men of Israel, Seize the prophets of Baal! Do not let one of them escape! Every false prophet was taken to the brook Kishon and slain by the men of Israel that day. Then Elijah said to King Ahab, Go up and eat and drink, for I hear the sound of the roar of a heavy rain shower. Elijah then climbed to the top of Mount Carmel to wait for the rain. He told his servant to go and look toward the sea for a sign of rain six times, and each time the servant saw nothing. Then on the seventh time, the servant saw a cloud as small as a man's hand coming up from the sea. Elijah said to his servant, Go tell King Ahab to get his horses and chariot and hurry down to Jezreel so he won't be caught in the heavy thunderstorm. Soon the clouds grew black and dark. A wind came up and a heavy rain shower poured down. The hand of God came upon Elijah and he jumped up and ran so fast that he beat King Ahab's horses and chariot to Jezreel that day. Once again, the mighty hand of God revealed his power. Many years passed and the people of Israel split into two separate kingdoms. The southern kingdom, named Judah, had two tribes and they desired to follow after God. The northern kingdom, called Israel, had ten tribes but they followed after false gods and idols. God not only grieved for the lost and wicked hearts of the tribes of Israel, but He also grieved over the wickedness of other nations. The city of Nineveh had become so wicked and sinful that the word of the Lord came to a prophet named Jonah, saying, Jonah, go to the city of Nineveh and warn them to repent of their wickedness. When Jonah heard this, he ran from the presence of God because he did not want to go. He found a ship heading to Tarshish, going in the opposite direction of Nineveh, and quickly boarded the ship. As soon as the ship sailed, God brought a great wind over the sea, causing a violent storm. The ship was about to break apart, and the sailors became so afraid that they called out to their false gods. They threw all their cargo and supplies overboard to lighten the ship, but even that did not help. During this time, Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship and fallen sound asleep. The captain ran down to Jonah and said, How is it that you're sleeping? Get up and call on your God. Maybe your God will answer and we will not die. Then Jonah jumped up and said to all the sailors on the ship, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and all the land. I've disobeyed the Lord my God and run from his presence. The men were terribly frightened and said, What shall we do to you so that the sea will become calm again and our lives will be saved? Jonah replied to the men, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. I know that because of me this great storm has come upon you. At first, the men did not want to throw Jonah overboard. Instead, they just tried harder to row back to dry land. But the waters of the sea became even more violent. Finally, in desperation, all the men cried out to the God of Jonah, O oh Lord, we pray, do not let us die on account of this man's life. Afterwards, they picked Jonah up and threw him overboard into the sea. The storm immediately stopped and the waters became calm. When all the men saw this happen, they feared the Lord and made vows to him. As soon as Jonah fell into the water, God sent a great fish to swallow him. Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. During this time, Jonah prayed and cried out to God, O oh God, I cried out to you, and you answered me. I cried for help, and you heard my voice. You cast me in the deep, and the water passed over me. But my prayer came to you, and you brought my life up from the pit. 
I will go and do as you say with thanksgiving in my heart. Salvation is from the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto dry land. The word of the Lord came to Jonah again and commanded him to go to the city of Nineveh. Jonah obeyed God and went to Nineveh, a very large city, a three days walk. When he arrived, Jonah walked through the city streets, crying out, In forty days, Nineveh will be overthrown if you do not change your wicked ways and turn to God. When the word of the Lord reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne and decreed, Let no man, beast, herd, or flock eat food or drink water. Now we must bow down and pray that God will forgive us of our wicked ways, and then, maybe, he will withdraw his burning anger so that we will not die. When God saw the people immediately obey the king's decree and turn from all their wickedness and evil, he no longer brought destruction upon them. The people of Nineveh turned their hearts to God and were saved. But this did not make Jonah happy. Instead, he became very angry and said to God, The people of Nineveh are our enemies, and yet you still showed them love and compassion? They do not deserve it. I'd rather die than to live now. Then Jonah went east of the city and sat down to watch what would happen to Nineveh. In the night, God caused a vine to quickly grow up and give shade to Jonah as he sat in the burning sun. This made Jonah very happy, but the next day a worm attacked the plant and it withered and died. God sent the scorching east wind and the sun beat down on Jonah's head and he became very weak. Once again, Jonah cried out, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God replied, You had compassion for a plant that came up overnight and then died. Shouldn't I also have compassion on a city of more than 120,000 people and give them a chance to repent of their evil ways? Isaiah was a prophet during the reign of King Hezekiah. When Isaiah was just a young man, he went to the temple to worship God. Suddenly, he saw a vision of the Lord sitting on his throne. All around him were angels singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the temple began to tremble at the voice of the Lord, and smoke began to fill the temple. Isaiah called out to God, O oh Lord, I am ruined. I am a man of evil words, and the people I live among are the same. Now my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Just then, one of the angels flew to him with a burning coal that the angel had picked up with a tong from the altar of God. The angel touched it to his lips and said, Behold, this coal has touched your lips, and your sin has been taken away and forgiven. Then Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord, saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Isaiah answered with all his heart, Here I am, send me. After this, Isaiah would spend his life as a prophet of God, constantly teaching and warning Israel and Judah to turn from their evil ways and turn their hearts back to God. Isaiah served as a prophet of God to four different kings that reigned during his lifetime, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. King Ahaz, Hezekiah's father, was known as one of Judah's worst kings. King Ahaz led the people of Judah as far away from God as possible. He allowed the temple, where the people worshipped God, to fall into great ruin and eventually shut the doors completely. Then King Ahaz set up idols of foreign gods and encouraged the people of Judah to worship them instead of the one true God. He led them into further sin by sacrificing his own sons on the altar of the foreign gods. But after his death, his son Hezekiah was determined to turn from his father's evil ways and bring the people back to worship God. He began his reign by tearing down all the altars of the foreign gods and idols the people had worshipped. Then he called 
the priest that God had put over his people to return to Jerusalem and Judah to clean and repair the temple. Finally, the temple doors were opened and ready for the people to come and worship God. At first, many of the people just laughed when they heard that the temple was ready for worship. They had spent many years worshiping false idols and gods, but many others were excited and ready to honor and worship God. Eventually, more and more people turned back to God and the nation of Judah became much stronger. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, King Sennacherib of Assyria attacked all the surrounding cities in Judah and took them into captivity. The only remaining city left was Jerusalem in Judah, where King Hezekiah reigned. At first, King Hezekiah tried to make peace with the Assyrians by giving gold and valuables to the king of Assyria. He even tore the silver and gold off the doors and walls of the temple, hoping this would be enough to keep the king of Assyria away. But King Sennacherib would not be satisfied until he had conquered the last remaining remnant of Judah. He sent his field commander with a large Assyrian army to the outside walls of Jerusalem, where many of the people of Judah could hear what was spoken. The commander said many things that weren't true in order to put great fear into the hearts of King Hezekiah and his people. He shouted, Do not trust your king when he tells you that God will deliver you from the hands of the Assyrians. When King Hezekiah's officials gave him this message from the commander, he immediately went to the temple and began praying to God. He also sent his officials to Isaiah the prophet. When Isaiah heard of the king's distress, Isaiah said, The Lord says, Do not be afraid of what the commander of the Assyrian army says. He has spoken lies against me, and therefore I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. But when the king of Assyria heard this message from King Hezekiah, he became even more angry and threatening. This time he sent a letter to King Hezekiah and told him, Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you. I will come and destroy you and your people, just like I have destroyed all of my other enemies. This time Hezekiah took the letter and went to the temple of God and spread it out before the Lord. Then he poured his heart out before the Lord, saying, O Lord, the God of this earth, Please hear my words and see with your eyes all the devastation the king of Assyria has brought upon your people. Now, O Lord our God, I pray that you will deliver us from this evil king so that all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you alone are God. Then Isaiah the prophet sent this message from God to King Hezekiah. Because you have prayed to me, this is the word I will speak against King Sennacherib of Assyria. He will not come to your city. He will not come before it with a shield or throw up a siege ramp or shoot one arrow against it. He will return the same way he came. For I will defend this city and save it for my own sake as well as the sake of my people. And just as the Lord declared, that night an angel of the Lord went out and struck dead 185,000 of the men in the army of Assyria. The next morning, when Sennacherib woke up and saw so many of his warriors dead, he packed up and returned to his land. The Lord God had delivered a remnant of the people of Judah from their enemies. King Sennacherib would not live long. One day, as he was worshiping in the temple of his pagan god, two of his sons came in and killed him with their swords.